Last episode, we talked about the truth of guys like Cooper Cup and Debo Samuel. It's kind of a cakewalk. Today, we're talking about guys that we really need to know. What is the truth of Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf? What is the truth of really hard to determine players? And I think we're going to get uh, a lot of information your way that you're going to like. Make sure you like this video, you subscribe, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the podcast, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, but you know that because you're not nasty. I'm here with my best friend, Jason Moore. Hello! It's me, Mike, the Fantasy Hitman, right? It is Thursday, February 3rd. We have made it into February. Super Bowl month. UDK month. There is that, yeah, I mean... We probably won't talk about that much today, but the UDK is that's available on Super Bowl Sunday, which means that the first edition of the Dynasty Pass is available in just what a week and a half or so. And we have been hot and heavy into rookies. That's what we're doing around the studio right now, preparing for the Dynasty Pass launch on Super Bowl Sunday, getting our rankings and our opinions and our uh, scouting done on all of the, the hot new incoming rookies. On today's show, it is the truth about wide receivers. Part two. Thank you. <laughs> this time it's personal. Uh, these are you know a little bit more interesting players to talk about. If you would like to watch the show, we are on the YouTube. YouTube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Follow us on the socials. Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. If you want to find Jason on there, he is at Jason FFL. I am at FF Hitman. Andy is at Andy Holloway, who we are hoping that we have Andy for next week's show. Seems likely. Seems yeah, that he was he was really he was questionable. Right. And then at the last minute downgraded to out for this episode. So I would imagine with the extra recovery time, you know, it's like a little bye week. Right. Uh, that he'll be back. Well, what I couldn't remember is on the on Tuesday's show. We were talking about, you know, when will Andy be back? It's it's the question that's is burning in the hearts of Andy's mother. <laughs> I was going to say millions of oh, Americans. Uh, millions of Americans, yes, exactly. But you you went out on the the limb and you were saying you think he'll be back. I wasn't sure how strong was that. Was that one of your patented Jason Moore guarantees? No, but it was it was seventy five percent. I thought he would be able to remote in today. Which, if you are not aware out there, <laughs> Foot Clan, I don't think we've ever. I don't think has we've that ever never been talked about on the show. No, no, <laughs> I don't think it has been. You know, a Jason Moore guarantee, ironclad. When it's yes. truly, truly one hundred percent, I promise there is there he has zero doubt when something is about to happen it's not gonna happen it's definitely not happening it's about as likely as the carry on johnson breakout mm. okay well i'll see myself out <laughs> <laughs> which is it's now become a running joke where and he keeps doing it. oh it's, it's unbelievable you had a you had a situation yes. this season where i needed where like over the second half of a game i needed jamal williams to score like three Fantasy and points. I gave you, I gave you one of my. I, there's only now, Foot Clan. There's only been what, like four of these. Like, the, yeah, I mean, the, there, the it, number is going up. The, yeah, but I mean, we're not talking like I dole these out every week, right? This is over the last several years. I've had four or five of them where I declare adamantly that it is a guarantee. And uh, yeah, how'd you do in that game that I guaranteed you? I lost. Yeah. Sorry about that. I think you were pretty pissed when I guaranteed it. <laughs> yes, because it was a curse. I knew what that meant. I still had some hope, and then that hope was squelched. I'm the new Madden. Uh, let's see. We went over the socials. Whatever. Let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. Since the time of our last recording, it is official. Plant and no. The Plant Man. Or Tom Brady, as some people out there still refer to him. He is officially retiring. How does that make you feel, Jay? 
uh, I mean, it's it, it's been a while now. I feel like I've come to terms with it, but I was very sad at first, and um, it really does mark the shift to the next era of the yeah, NFL. So ben is gone. Ben is gone. Tom is gone. Obviously, Rivers, Breeze were this last year. Uh, I'd throw Peyton in there. Um, you know, that whole, oh, no, I remember, man, this was not, this was like three years ago where it was like, wow, all the quarterbacks are starting to age out. Mm -hmm. This NFL could be a mess. This could be like really bad five years from now. And then Mahomes, Josh Allen, Herbert, Herbert. Kyler, I mean, it's the Burrow in the Super Bowl. I mean, right. the, the, the next generation is here. And I think that this new era of the NFL I mean, this is a fantasy football show. It's going to be great for fantasy. Just air it out. Let's go. It is official out of Washington. We have a team name. I'm sure you've heard it, but just in case you have not, they are officially the Washington Commanders. <laughs> the Washington Commanders. I mean, mixed reviews. Well, here's the problem. When you take two name or two years to come up with a name, it doesn't matter what the name is yeah, because you're, it, people are going to be disappointed. There's no way that they could have come out with a name that I would have been like, now I get it. Now I understand <laughs> what took so long because nobody was able to come up with that, but it took you two years. Uh, yeah, the commanders, you know, I think they want to have their whole like take command phrase. They want to have their go pack go. Mm -hmm. There's not a good nickname, though. Wait, so if it's the Go Pack, because Go Pack Go is a chant. It's like, Go Pack Go. So what? Take, take a man. Oh, that's not good. No, that, that's fine. I'm fine with that. Really? Now, do the fans go commando to the games? <laughs> is that like part of? <laughs> I'm not wearing any underpants. Let's do this. Go, go, commando. <laughs> that's a much better chant. Yeah. The Washington Commandos, they're here. <laughs> uh, Jalen Hurts, quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. He is uh, will undergo surgery on his ankle. He is expected to fully recover for the start of OTAs. But you know, as the the this happens every year, the injury news starts to trickle out at the end. And it seems like Jalen Hurts was playing on a bad ankle for quite some time. And when his play, it correlates when his play kind of started to fall off. So hopefully that explains what happened at the end of the season and yes. then he's good to go yeah sometimes you you kind of nebulously hope that that was the case but if you really look at his game log he got injured in week 12 missed week 13 and week 12 is basically when he started to not perform for fantasy missed week 13 at the bye week and then you know his two bad performances for fantasy were after that injury so Hopefully that did have an impact, and he sh because he should be fully recovered by OTAs, you, you should have the most mobile, active version right. of, of Hertz ready to go next year, and we saw it through those first 11 weeks. He was easily the most consistent quarterback. Oh, gosh. I had no idea what was about to happen there. Uh, an absolute bombshell came out a couple days ago. Former Dolphins coach Brian Flores is uh, launching a lawsuit against the NFL and the in the Giants for alleged racism during hiring. It there is a lot going on in this situation. Uh, if you haven't dove in, which that would be surprising at this point, is dominating the headlines. Uh, highlighted by a text message from Bill Belichick. Oh, BB, BB, yeah, BB with a lot of exclamation points, uh, congratulating Brian Dable on getting the job. Except. He was talking to Brian Flores in text, and Flores had not even interviewed yet. There's a lot of things that th that need to be investigated here, and hopefully that they get their proper investigation. The big things in terms of not just <laughs> – that's humongous, uh, but we want to talk about like fantasy impact here. Part of the allegations are Flores is saying the owner of the Miami Dolphins – was offering him a hundred thousand dollars to tank. So per loss, uh, a couple years ago, Brian Flores could have lear earned a hundred thousand dollars allegedly. Now there are more reports. By the time you're hearing this, there could be even more reports coming out. Uh, Stephen Ross, owner of the the, of the the Dolphins, but you had Cameron Wolf on the NFL Network saying that he has spoken to uh, 
one witness and that there are uh, multiple potential witnesses talking about this situation because if that, in fact, comes out to be true... The hammer will be swung. You, I mean, like, how many draft picks do the Dolphins lose if that can be proved? Yeah, I mean, I... After, like, look at Spygate. Like, the, what did... Uh, Kyle, Kyle, do you remember? Look up real quick what the Patriots lost from Spygate. Yeah, I mean, certainly this is one of those things that goes to the heart of the competition of the NFL. And, uh, you know, if if that comes out proven true, which seems likely. Um, yeah, I mean, they're... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the hammer will come down hard uh, on, uh, on the Dolphins. So their draft capital should vanish, which is ironic because he was wanting to pay for more draft cap so the Patriots lost a third rounder and they were fined over a million dollars for that and you have it's not just Flores now you have Marvin Lewis is backing him up Hugh Jackson is backing up Flores's uh allegations as well I I can't pretend to know what they're going through and what they have been through just really hope that the proper investigation is launched and they are up against it man the this is the NFL protecting its own interests just a very, very tough and difficult situation to navigate. Uh, do we have any more news? I mean, that's really – that's the news and will be the news moving forward. But do we have anything else? Nothing yet. All right. Let's get into the truth part two. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Tuesday's episode was part one with fellows like Cooper Cup, Debo, Devontae Adams, Jeff Justin Jefferson. So if you're looking for their names, they were on part one. Now the truth about fantasy wide receivers, we are looking at consistency. We are looking at how many great games or percentage of great games, percentage of good games and bust games. And those are defined by us. We set the thresholds here. A great game is 20 points. A good game is more than 12 points. And a bust game is fewer than... Then eight points. And this we, is in half points. Yes, scoring. half point scoring, and we do not count missed games against the player for their consistency score. Wide receiver. Now, now oh, real, go ahead. real quick, before we move on to the specific wide receivers, we've done this for years, and the formula is tweaked a little bit every year. Um, I have been questioning during this season whether or not it is right to not penalize missed games. The rationale okay. <clears throat> has been. Well, if they if they missed the game, not got injured in the game, but they missed the game, no one was going to start them. Correct. You weren't trying to see what's the truth of this player on the field, and that's what this series is about. Like, what is the truth of the player on the field? But I do think that, you know, it, it kind of seems, it feels unfair when we look at some of these players who are listed as more consistent, but you really felt a, a hurt through the season when they missed two games here or there. And so I've been wondering... Should I add into the formula a slight penalty per missed game, or should we leave it as it's been? I think you leave it as is for consistency because we're we're trying to find out the truth when someone is on the field. I mean, I availability is an ability, at, you know, as uh, as the the coaching saying goes. So maybe there's a way to uh, you know factor that in, but I think that would be a different way to look at how a player performed you you feel like it should be added in um i'm i'm on the fence i've i've gone back and forth producers what do you guys think way in here i think we need it the way it is but then also we could maybe have a separate number to see like what their rank would be if you were to count injuries or something Does that's that too much sense? i don't like <laughs> okay. i don't like it kyle then, what do you got <laughs> they need to be penalized oh oh man kyle's so angry He's just a real mean if, if Footland, if you you know, yeah. Kyle's Kyle's new to being on the show, if you're not aware of personality wise, one of the meanest spirited just people. Just hate in his heart. So hateful. Yeah. Um that's Kyle. And the writers <laughs> know that because he's been the editor and he just iron fist. Um well thank you guys for weighing in. There I appreciate are def that. Jason, there are definitely people listening to this show who now believe that that is the truth. Well, yeah, look, he's the most hateful and Brooks is the richest man on the planet. These are just truths we can't <laughs> We can't do We're that. a real extreme show. Yeah. Thank you, computer. Uh, so wide receiver 11 on the season, Hunter Renfro coming in, a consistency rank of nine. He was much better in the second half where he was 
on the dot, the consistent wide receiver number nine, number 18 over the first half. Now he'd certainly had some correlation of once Darren Waller was missing time, Hunter Renfro became the go-to guy. You also had the uh, the Henry Ruggs situation where he was removed from the team. But if you look at what he did, only 6% of his games were great. But, I mean, that's not – when you're playing Hunter Renfro, that's not really what your goal is. Uh, a great game. You're not hoping for the you – don't, you don't slot him in as your wide receiver too, and you're like, yep, that's the guy. That's the nitro that my, uh, that my fantasy team needs. But – you know that he's going to help you. 53% of the time, it was a good game. Only 18% of his games, he busted. His his splits between top and bottom defenses are 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 fine. Nothing egregious there. His home road splits, he's slightly better on the road. Now, maybe due to an uptick in passing. But, I mean, he was... Once, the, once week nine hit, he was great for your fantasy team. I think that the truth that fantasy managers need to get to the bottom of for next year is was this yes due to being yes. without Darren Waller is that the reason why you know going into next year we're going to presume Waller is healthy and active and I'm I also assume they will bring in another wide receiver right they lost um Henry Ruggs they found out found out uh through enough time that Brian Edwards can't play football and so they need to bring in another wide receiver um and so the question will be going into drafts next year was this just a mirage created by Darren Waller's absence and the answer is that while he did have a higher points per game in the games without Waller than he did with Waller this season slightly his breakout you you brought it up it was in week 9 it was when that was that was basically when rugs was gone um over there by week uh time from Darren Waller wasn't out until week 13. So you had a stretch where Renfro really caught the most fire of the season. That was when Waller was still there. So I believe next year coming into the season, um, I mean, it'll be different if they go and make a massive change um, at wide receiver, a big splashy acquisition. I don't, I don't know that really there's Could be any... Zay Jones, who th – they had Zay Jones on a one year, and uh, him also in the second half, not nearly as much as uh, as Renfro, but I mean, he started to really turn things on and become uh, uh, the go-to wide receiver two in the system. You have all new pieces around in management, new head coach, new GM. And Derek Carr is in the final year of his contract where he will be turning 31. He's going to make, you know, about $20 million. He could also be cut for zero dead cap. Like, I don't – I'm not going to project that, that that will be the move. I think that even the new uh, – with the new management and everything coming in and taking over, you'll go one year with Carr and then find a, a replacement quarterback – but just throwing it out there in the ether for like dynasty situation. If you're, I'm going after Hunter Renfro. Derek Carr is a variable that may or may not be there. I, I agree with that. Looking more redraft focused though, I I think Hunter Renfro has a really good season. Mike, who when I say who's the best slot wide receiver of the last decade? Who are the first guys that come to mind? Like the last ten years or so. Who's... I mean, you like you think of the like. The, the Brady slot wide receivers. Exactly. You think of Wes Welker. Yeah. You think of Julian Edelman. And who's the new head coach? McDaniels. Of the Las Vegas Raiders. It's McDaniels coming in. So the breakout that we saw from uh, from Renfro, combined with the system that really has been productive for the slot wide receiver and his talent, I, I think I'm going to be into Renfro next year because he's not going to be someone that – he, you know, he's not going to be drafted like he was the wide receiver eleven. No, he will not. Um, he'll and, be he'll be interesting to see his ADP. He was just to, you know, illustrate how great he was. The second player in NFL history with an eighty plus percent catch rate on a hundred or more targets. He joined Michael Thomas into that statistic. He was fantastic. His ADP will be fan, or, you know, very interesting to watch. The next wide receivers, wide receiver twelve and thirteen. It's the boys from Seattle, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett. They ran. I mean, 
It is outrageous the crossfade that these two put together mm-hmm. uh, for my audio nerds out there. But the first half, I mean, you had the first two games, Tyler Lockett was great, but then it was DK Metcalf for that first half. Then the bye week hits, and then it was Tyler Lockett. You have the first half, DK Metcalf was the wide receiver three in consistency. The second half, wide receiver 41. Lockett, first half, 33, second half, 12. Lockett did have a higher percentage of his games as great, but Lockett also had more bust games at 38% compared to 24. What do you make of these two, and how do we – how do we look at the future of you know DK Metcalf? Who this is now this is two years in a row. So it's pretty easy this year to go. Well, Russell Wilson had the thumb problem. You know he his deep ball was looked off track. He kind of maybe got it going towards the end of it, but also during that stretch, Tyler Lockett over the second half was still performing with a with a busted Russell Wilson and DK has now done this two years in a row where he got off to a really hot start and then fades over the second half of the season. Was that hard to say? Busted Russell Wilson? That was did really... I, did no, I, no, no. Did you, I get it out? You nailed it. But I was. it was really impressive I'm, to me. I'm very articulate. Busted Russell Wilson. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, so that's the question, right? What is the truth of these guys? Well, we know what the truth is with Tyler Lockett. We've seen it long enough. He's awesome. He is great. He is he a is, great... Real world wide receiver, and yes. he is inconsistent for fantasy. Sure, he'll have his games where he ends up being the dude, and his games where he's not. So the question with Metcalf is: Look, the first half of the year he was he was unbelievable. Then the injury came to Russell Wilson. Russ sucked. DK Metcalf sucked. Is that the truth? Or if you really look, you're talking about the crossfade between Metcalf and Lockett. If you really look at the games, like the first two weeks when Russ was healthy. Lockett was unbelievable. Yep. The wide receiver six, the wide receiver two. Uh, Metcalf, not as much. Right. It, like, they, they really only had one single week, week eight, where both guys were really good for fantasy. And I think that that's, That was against the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> right. I think that's more of the truth. I think the truth is that both of these guys are great wide receivers. Russ is going to be better next year because he is not going to presumably have a broken uh, hand for half of it. And is he a Seahawk? Russell Wilson will be a Seahawk, yes. Okay. I think Russell Wilson, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, those guys will be uh, the same situation going into next year's draft. I'm going to take whoever the bigger discount is, which that's will be I, Tyler Lockett. That's what I was going to ask. So this year's ADP, DK was the wide receiver five going in the second round. Meanwhile, Lockett was in the fifth round as the wide receiver 20. It, it's not that DK Metcalf was a a – a catastrophic bust on that draft day value going from the wide receiver five, but finishing as 12. Like that's not terrible, but Lockett outperformed his. And I have to imagine that while Metcalf won't likely be the wide receiver five, he'll still be in that third round. He's going to be a top 10 wide receiver drafted. He, he will be. And then Lockett probably goes in the fifth round again, if not the back of the fourth. So, Oh, he'll go fifth is the highest that Lockett will go. Do you think so? Do you think we'll still fade him a bit? Because you you got burnout with Lockett. You you have he's not the new hotness, um, and he's been inconsistent. So fifth round is the highest he'll go. I love Tyler Lockett there. If you draft a DK Metcalf at the end of the season, uh, assuming you did not trade him halfway through, um, then you were disappointed. If you drafted Tyler Lockett, then in the fifth round you were not disappointed. I think you're going to have more of the same of that. So you have DK Metcalf had the third most uh, or the the most unrealized air yards, uh, which I like talking about air yards. It's fun. It's fun. Uh, and then on the other side, Lockett players with a hundred plus targets, a thousand plus receiving yards, and eight touchdowns in each of the last three years. Mike Evans and Tyler Lockett. Like yeah. Lockett has been so. Good. He is so good. He the problem is it just comes in bursts. So yes. is, he's not going to be consistent for your team. Know what you're getting. And when you're drafting in the fifth round, that is often your third wide receiver. So, so if you go running back, running back, wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, now you're right. talking about a guy who can win you a week and and dominate for fantasy, who you don't have to rely on to be your consistent uh wide receiver one. So I, I do like the value there. At this point, if you went running back, running back, are you good with 
would you be good with Metcalf as your wide receiver one? No, because I think you're going to have inconsistencies when Lockett has his big games. I mean, the truth is pretty obvious. When one of these two guys gets a 60-yard bomb touchdown, the drive is over for the other one. Sure. The yards can't be accumulated. So it's very difficult for both guys to have good games, and they're both great players. The next player we're going to talk about was the wide receiver 15, Michael Pittman Jr. Oh. We built this city. <laughs> he finishes the year with 129 targets, 88 receptions, almost 1,100 yards, and six touchdowns. He was he was better during the you know the first half of the season, weeks one through nine. He was the wide receiver nine, and then from week ten on, as the Colts passing game completely crumbled, he was only the wide receiver thirty. He had the fourth most contested catches in the NFL. How do you, now that it's done, Jason, how do you feel about the season as, at large for Michael Pittman, who was drafted as the wide receiver 44 mm -hmm. at the back of the ninth round? So to be drafted there, finish at wide receiver 15, even though he wasn't great over the second half of the season, how do you feel about him? Yeah, I mean, he, he definitely had a... And what if I do this? We built this okay. City. Okay. Opinions going up. Going Opinions up. Opinions going up. Thank you. Um, he had a he had a very good season. I think what happened in the beginning of the year kind of set the expectations and the hopes to be the true year two breakout. That did not happen. In fact, I'm surprised. Like when here we are, wide receiver 15. We're talking about Michael Pittman. I'm like, really? Michael Pittman finished as the wide receiver. That's right. It doesn't feel like that. Um, and I didn't have him on a lot of my rosters, so maybe that's, you know, it's the experience that was um, lacking, or it was just the end of the year collapse for the Colts and the, the outlook going forward where you don't even know who the quarterback is. Is it going to be Wentz, probably? Yeah, I think they don't stuck. want it to be Wentz. Um, you know, but I, the reality is he is a very talented, very young wide receiver. Um, we've talked a lot about the wide receiver the second year breakout but that doesn't end there it's not like they then regress in year three uh, he should continue to get better he had the experience of being the one this year and as the season went along and more tape was there he started getting shut down so I think you know an offseason program um, I'm gonna like I'm gonna like pity I, I've, I've always had a soft spot for Michael Pittman I think he's a very good wide receiver I mean uh, looking at the guys of the true second year breakout like Obviously, Jefferson was much better, but Justin Jefferson had a massive breakout as a rookie. You know, looking through the list, you got CD who was great and disappointing. Uh, you got Pittman who was good and disappointing. Right, but I'm saying like, didn't what did CD Lamb finish? CD Lamb finished as the wide receiver 18. So, I mean, of the second year wide receivers who made the jump, Pittman seemed like he made the biggest jump. Yeah, and it, why doesn't it feel that way? Because <laughs> like, over asking. the second half, he was the wide receiver 30. Um, and it, and that's where, I mean, you get the closing argument, and that's the, the opinions start to get skewed. The wide receiver 16, rookie sensation Jalen Waddle. Waddle waddled as he waddled away. 141 targets, over 100 receptions, broke the rookie record, 1,000 receiving yards, six touchdowns. This was also a very interesting season. Uh, the Dolphins, it's things started out quite poorly for them. Uh, and then it, they made him a focal point of the offense. From, uh, from week 6 through 13, he was the wide receiver 3. He didn't get the big plays, which was interesting because like Waddle's calling card is he's faster than you. Oh, like, yeah. He is he's outrageously fast, and yet only ten deep targets. He was a yards after catch type of guy. His splits are are just fine. So what do you do with the with this player who has the most receptions ever for a rookie wide receiver? Uh, I mean, you you have to assume he's and going he, to be extremely highly drafted, and it finished poorly as the wide receiver fifty five and thirty seven. Uh, <laughs> Those are the last two weeks. Um, yeah. You know, we, every wide receiver is going to have down weeks. If they go back to back, who cares? Um, if you 
played DFS or you had Jalen Waddle, you you know, you had him as part of that run from week six on, you realized how important he was to this offense. And that was when they were winning games. You know, they went one and seven and then they went seven uh wins in a row. And that was with Jalen Waddle, the guy they drafted to be great being great. I think going forward you're going to have a team whose identity runs through Jalen Waddle, very similar to how Justin Jefferson has become, you know, at least the identity of the receiving game. So the question for Jalen Waddle has nothing to do with Jalen Waddle to me. Uh, it just is Tua. It's it's the quarterback okay. situation and, and um, maybe the coaching situation, which has not been resolved as of this recording. So I am all in on the talent of Jalen Waddle. You break the rookie receiving uh, receptions number. You have his talent, his speed. He showed it on the NFL field that he can get it done. And there's so much room to grow, right? Like, what was he, like 10 yards a catch? I mean, with a guy with his speed, if he gets 104 receptions, you'd expect him to be up at 1,300 plus yards, not just breaking 1,000. So I think that there is room for improvement. Um, and whether or not the Tua takes a step forward, I mean, I, I'm I'm usually the one betting against that. So I bet on Jalen Waddle, bet against Tua. How would that land next year for his outlook? Well, one of the things we need is the head coach. One of the fellas who is still in contention is Mike McDaniels from San Francisco. And the whispers are he views what he could do with Jalen Waddle similar to Debo Samuel. Now – I don't know. I, mean, I I don't know if you can replicate what Debo has done, but that's that's interesting that you're going to get if you get him all those sh short yardage receptions and then you add in some trick plays where they definitely had a couple trick plays. I remember him going in the backfield mm -hmm. and then getting a pretty pretty easy touchdown out of it. But that's well, the, that's I, interesting. I think the I think the two ways that that comp makes sense is one rushing attempts. You didn't really have Jalen Waddle. He had two rushing attempts on the season, and with his speed, you get the ball in his hands. Obviously, Waddle's not the tackle breaker that Debo is. Right. He's not the tackle. I mean, nobody is. Um, but, uh, you know, the other side of that is the screen games. One of the things that the 49ers were so good at is game planning through Debo. Like, they built a system where they were going to – manufacture touches for him and get blockers out in front of him. Um, and I think if you do that for Waddle, that would be great. So if, if he ends up becoming the head coach, uh, Arrow goes even further up because that's the that's where Tua can succeed. I don't think Tua is going to succeed getting him the ball 14, 15, 20 plus yards down the field all the time, but he can get him the screen game. All right, these next two wide receivers, this – this one is difficult. Wide receiver 18 on the season, C.D. Lamb, who will, over the first half was uh, in consistency, was the wide receiver 12. That fell to wide receiver 30. Amari Cooper, wide receiver 27 on the season, wide receiver 27 in consistency. They both had only 13% of their games were great. They both had an above-average bust rate. Which like, would be below average in a way. It was worse. It was negative. Okay, yes. Yeah, we want, we want that to be clear. 31% of Lamb's games were a bust. 40% for Amari Cooper. I felt I felt those 40%. <laughs> yeah, Amari Cooper ones? Yeah, I did. That's, that's why I'm excited to talk about this, because I know you're a C.D. Lamb guy. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like underneath that C.D. Lamb jersey, you had your Amari Cooper oh, jersey on just – just ready for sure. Just, Honestly, I am a CD ready Lamb to rip guy. the Lamb jersey off. Say, I've been with you the whole time, Amari. He, he was. My, I never left you. Uh, I mean, CD was my my guy, but one hundred percent. When you said I fe when you called me a CD Lamb guy, I was like, eh, that kind of feels insulting because I'm an Amari Cooper guy as well. I'm also a Dak guy, <laughs> and this was a this was this was disappointing. Um, the passing game did not do what you hoped. You the part of that. And I would say the the major reason for it, right? Because I don't think Amari Cooper did anything bad. CeeDee Lamb did anything bad as far as talent on the field, uh, poor execution, any of that type of stuff. And you love the doctor. Oh, the doctor. Well, I'm not. I just love the nickname. 
Oh, I'm not okay. like huge into Dr. Schultz. I just okay. think it's a, what a what a great nickname. Um, but <laughs> how do we come up with this stuff? <laughs> Here's the issue: is the defense. The defense has Parsons and Diggs have taken them from one of the worst defenses in the NFL over the last several years, b before the last two, to one of the best defenses. And uh, I believe they were the highest. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't they score the most defensive touchdowns this year? Uh, the producers can vet me Sounds on that. Sounds right. Uh, but that, I mean, those things really do have a correlation for being bad for the passing attack. If your team is up and winning the game based on defensive scoring, you run the ball more and all of a sudden your wide receivers aren't needed. So this is a really um, curious case here for me because I do love the talent. I love the offensive potential and in games where they had to really air it out you know they they had big performances but I just don't know that this is when you've got a couple of mouths to feed and a really solid defense it's not a recipe for fantasy glory and on top of that you have Kellen Moore who has been kind of the mastermind of the offense the last couple of years for Dallas he is also one of the remaining candidates uh, with the who's talking to Miami right now. Uh, it's so funny to me that McCarthy is thought of like people don't like his offense, but people love Kellen Moore's offense. But it's and the it wasn't. Same, it's the same offense, right? Like, well, this yeah. I mean, I mean, the, sort of because the the offense for McCarthy was Aaron Rodgers. Please do something. But I, you, well, I'm just saying the 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 outlook. I feel like it's it's a negative outlook towards Mike McCarthy's offensive scheme and a sure. positive one towards Kellen Moore, but we're disappointed with what the Dallas Cowboys offense did this year. So who was it? Was it Mike McCarthy's fault? Then why is Kellen Moore getting – that's just a really weird situation to me. I feel like it's uh, like name value and not reality. A lot of it falls on Kellen Moore, but at the same time, any time that I can just – verbally drop a deuce on Mike McCarthy. Mm, that is fun. Pants down. Yeah, pants down. <laughs> deuce happening. out. Uh, yeah. For no, Harambe. That's a, good, that's, a good, that's a good point, Mike. And I think a lot of people share that. It's a lot of fun to pile on McCarthy. It is. <laughs> it is. So I, there they will be a curious case to watch next year. And just like all of the off-season chatter of Jerry Jones being disappointed in Amari Cooper, his $100 million man, Mari Cooper is still owed a lot of money over the next three years. He will be turning 28, and they can get out pretty easily. Not yet. Not this offseason, right? This year would be only a $6 million debt cap. Really? Yeah. Wow. I'm he looking, just at least signed on, that $100 million contract. That's crazy. It was very front-loaded, it seems like. So, just going forward, Amari Cooper – is drafted, let's say, in the what round? What round do you think Amari Cooper is going to be drafted in? Mm. Probably fourth. I think round. he'll drop to the fifth. Do you? I do. I, Lockett I, or Cooper? I would take Lockett. Okay. That'll be an interesting debate. Next wide receiver. Oh, he's near and dear to my heart. And get this man a freaking quarterback because he's near to the heart. And my heart is breaking every single year. For DJ Moore. Also, for clarity, Jimmy Garoppolo is not the quarterback to get him. Uh, I'm, I am clarifying sure. that. That okay, wasn't a question. Yes. Okay. That, okay. Was, that was me letting people know because I think that that's a really probable destination. Like, Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be traded. He's good. They're right. working on it right now. And there's only a handful of teams that really would pay up and try to go get him and see him as the, the cure, you know, the Washington uh, commanders commanders <laughs> that is that's is the first time i've had to first time i've had to actually say it in I conversation heard that you wanted to put football team out there 100 percent. washington, washington command oh and if you start with football team and you switch to commanders be careful, oh, be that's, careful. that's a problem <laughs> the Whoa! yeah no thank you mike that's <laughs> you just gotta stick with football team at that point <laughs> Yep. Thank you uh for Woo. that for that glorious Woo. warning. Um yeah, so I my uh I I think Jimmy Garoppolo will be the quarterback, starting quarterback for another team this season and it could be some, someone like the Panthers who are quarterback needy 
And I guess I'm just saying that while I do think if DJ Moore got a quarter, if they were the sweepstakes winner of Aaron Rodgers, DJ Moore would be back of the first to me. Whoa! Uh, top of the second. I think his talent is there. and He is, like, DJ Moore is great. Dealing with all of the quarterback nonsense that he has over his four-year career, aside from his rookie year, which his rookie year he hit 788 yards, which that's really not bad for a rookie wide receiver. But since that time, he has been just under 1,200 receiving yards each of the last three years, only four touchdowns in each season. But, I mean, those – He's so good. When you watch him on the field, if they could get someone who could reliably get him the ball. But anyway, so DJ Moore, only 6% of his games were great. Only 41% were good. Uh, he was kind of a lot of times in that limbo between Meh. between bust and a good game, unfortunately. DJ Meh. Yeah. That was See, bad. In, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. Thank because you. I'm a big fan of that type of a joke, but it just it hurts me because I cape for DJ Moore and I I proclaim that none of this is his fault. The truth, except for the good stuff. That's that is totally his fault. The truth, getting you know back to that where we're trying to you know illuminate is that this is three years in a row of extreme talent, decent uh, result, but disappointing outcome like it's it's yes. true to say that he yes. had a decent season and also that everyone was disappointed in dj moore and i think that what you have seen through four years of his career is exactly what you're going to get next year i'm not if jimmy garoppolo comes to town there's going to be hope there's going to be hype there's going to be he's finally got a quarterback and i'm not buying in at all i'm not i'm not doing it he, he we know what he is he is who we think he is now uh, I mean, you just said it, right? Like the last three years, he's basically been 1,150 yards and four touchdowns. He's inconsistent through the season, but consistent on the year. Um, and I think that there's a place for him in your fantasy lineup. I think, you know, as a as a wide receiver three, you're good. But because of his youth and his athletic profile, we've been drafting him on the hopeful upside of him sure. turning into a top eight wide receiver. And that's just not happening without a prolific quarterback. Yeah, the so fifth most targets and receiving yards for a wide receiver before turning 25. He has been dominant. Very interesting, though, of looking at DJ Moore's season going, ah, disappointing. Finished as wide receiver 19, drafted as the wide receiver 19. And yet, we are disappointed on a complete break even of draft day value. Well, yeah, because you're you're not drafting him. Because at, we're curmudgeons. You're not drafting him to be the wide receiver 19. You're drafting him hoping he takes that leap. I mean, <laughs> it, <laughs> let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Are you? Let's say you yep. go and you buy a scratcher card, and you scratch that ticket off, and it says free scratcher card. You're disappointed, right? Are you? Are you like? Wait, yes. So I want another scratcher. You want another scratcher card? Oh heck yeah. Okay, well, then that's the difference between us because what you did here is you bought T.J. Moore and you got exactly what you paid for. It was like, oh, this is a value of $5. I paid $5. Great. But you're not buying the $5 scratcher to get $5. You're disappointed. You're like, I wanted the $50,000. So when you, go, when you go into the arcade and you change in your dollar for tokens, you put your dollar in and it gives you four tokens, you're like, what the heck, man? I'm t I put a dollar in this machine. I was, I was supposed to get a buck fifty back. More lottery than, <laughs> you know, you're, you're taking your shots at, at big winners here in fantasy football. He is in the final year of his career. He'll be going to the – or career. His uh, uh, contract heading into that fifth-year option. The wide receiver 20 on the season. Here we are again. I'm so disappointed. You're disappointed in Brandon Cooks? 100%. I mean, he was awesome this he year. He was drafted as the wide receiver 39. I'm just disappointed that he didn't finish inside the top 15. Ah. Uh, because, you know, you look at his career fantasy finishes, 14, 9, 12, 13, injured, 15, 20. So now we have to say he's always been a top 20 wide receiver, okay. whereas prior to this year, top 15. No, of course you can't be disappointed in what Brandon Cooks did. With, Ninety receptions over a thousand yards and six touchdowns. Yeah, and 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 rather consistent. 
Um, he was he had a better consistency rank than even his fantasy finish of twenty, um, and that was because even though he didn't have these massive win you a week games, because it's hard to do that with General Mills at quarterback. But fifty six percent, the majority of his games were good fantasy games, not meh. But where we we established like these are you're happy he was in your lineup. Um, and even better was that you could kind of predict when some of those games were going to be bad. So I, I think Brandon Cooks is always going to be underdrafted, undervalued, and disrespected. He is the Robert Woods of four years ago today. Okay, I can see that. he He's a little more splashy than Robert Woods is. Makes big plays. Yeah, I just mean that in the sense that Robert Woods, you always knew he's not going to be a a, a top five wide receiver, but you knew when you were drafting him, like when you, it's perfect example back to back with DJ Moore, right? Because fantasy football, a lot of it's about roster construction. When you're, when you're looking and you are literally in the draft and you're saying, do I want to draft? I'll bet these guys were near each other, Robert Woods and DJ Moore. When you, when you draft, when you make the decision to go Robert Woods, you are hoping for the wide receiver 15. You know, if you grab him at wide receiver 15, you just think, He's got such a high floor. I know I'm not getting anything crazy special, but he's going to outproduce by some degree. Whereas with DJ Moore, it's more risky, and you're just hoping that you get the outlandish, great fantasy finish. I think Brandon Cooks is one where wherever you draft him, he's going to outproduce that because people don't care about Brandon Cooks anymore. Brandon Cooks is essentially in the last year of his contract. Um, he'll He's 28 this year. He technically has a couple more years on the books, but those are seem like uh, voidable years to spread out the contract. He'll be interesting to like what it, could he get traded again? Well, Brandon Cooks can always be traded. I mean, <laughs> that's like one yes. of his favorite things. <laughs> um, I think he's trying to live in all fifty states, and so oh, that could be his bucket list, right? So I think that's where he's going to the general manager saying, "You can get a good draft pick for me," because he can't. You, yes, he always comes at a cost. But no, I I think that you know if you're the Houston Texans, you don't have a lot of free agents knocking down the door to come play for you right now. I can't imagine that they would look to unload Brandon Cooks, who was good. They've got something potentially in Davis Mills, and going into year two, having a Brandon Cooks. I mean, Brandon Cooks should be better next year than he was this year, and he was good this year. Uh, the remaining players of uh, that we could talk about up. I'll just list them, Jason. You see, you tell me who you want to talk about. So Amon Ross St. Brown was the wide receiver 21. T. Higgins was 22. We kind of talked about him with Jamar Chase. Hollywood Marquise Brown Hollywood. At, at 23. Darnell Mooney, uh, what, a.k.a. the werewolf. The werewolf. Yeah, the moon's out. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's the where where are we on the werewolf? Are we? It's are gone. you still you're no. letting it, letting it go into the yeah? I, that's gone. It's never gonna. It's stick. fading away like a a werewolf back into a human exactly when the moon's right. gone. It's it's a crescent. Um, so he's not the werewolf anymore. I I I think that that nickname you've got like a statute of limitations for it to stick. If it doesn't okay. stick, then that it gets uh, wiped from history and you move on. Um, I think the player to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about Amon Ross St. Brown in a couple weeks. We've got the rookie review show coming up. I'll tell you what, uh, because we don't go anywhere in the offseason, we will eventually talk about all of these players. Several times, but Hollywood Brown, and while I'm talking, why don't you find the drop? Because I love oh. the Hollywood drop. But Hollywood Brown was unbelievable. He was so oh, thank you. Hollywood Brown was as good and as consistent as any wide receiver in the first half of the year when Lamar Jackson was healthy. Um, wide receiver five through week nine. Yeah, I mean, he was a locked and loaded every week. Target, yardage, just exactly what you know we had hoped we had in Hollywood Brown. Um, and then, obviously, the second half of the year, he super disappointed you. Let you down in a major way wasn't a factor. But you had Lamar miss week 11, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And so it's like, well, duh. I mean, obviously, Mark Andrews still kept it going, so you could be like, mm, Mark did it. But these backup quarterbacks aren't going to be able to really have multiple superstars supported. Otherwise, they'd be starting quarterbacks. Yeah, that's a fair point. 
So I, I think Hollywood Brown is – I think the truth of Hollywood Brown is he is going to be a great fantasy asset next and year. he was dead. Like, for fantasy purposes, the the entire community and guilty as charged, we had moved on. He was the wide receiver 51 in draft. So a, a player you took in round 11 – you have to be very excited with the return that you got for fantasy football, even with it fading away in the second half. I guess you could be a little bit bitter that you kept playing him, thinking it was going to turn around. I certainly thought it would turn around. But 91 catches, over 1,000 yards, six touchdowns. So where do you feel like from – because it was dead, then back to full relevance in the first half and then really disappointing second half. Where do you think the community is going to land on him for draft price? I think it will be primarily negative. Um, I think that people will assume that the outlier was the beginning of the season. They're going to say Rashad Bateman is now more involved. Mark Andrews is kind of leveled up to be the number one target, and the pie might not be big enough to really split up. And I think that that is a fair argument. I don't personally believe that that is the truth I think the truth is that Hollywood is the primary target in this offense him and Mark Andrews the same way that you know Tyreek and Travis Kelsey are fine with one another um, I don't look at Rashad Bateman as someone that will overtake that that primary role as the number one receiver in the offense and that to me is really what you have to what you have to get right to be right like is it going to be Marquise Brown as the one or is it or is Bateman going to overtake that role and uh, you know we'll know next year but I think it's Hollywood and hopefully we'll get better Lamar uh he, he missed a lot of games at the end with the ankle injury but he was he wasn't the Lamar that we have come to know and love uh, he just something was awry for the Baltimore Ravens that's going to do it for today's episode. Whew, Jason, we did it. The truth about wide receivers. I think that it's it's out there now. We but now know no lies. <laughs> we know no? We know. Well, that was with a K. Oh, it wasn't no, N -O, N -O, no, no. Without a K, lies. We know no lies because now we have the truth of wide receivers. Uh, are you going to watch the, the Pro Bowl? No, of course not. <laughs> no, uh, I would never. That's why. Why would you turn that on? Um, I will watch. Here's how I watch the Pro Bowl because this is the best way to watch it. Okay, clips that circulate on Twitter because there's some fun plays and some cool moments and things like that. But no, um, you, but I did. I did start watching. Uh, what was it called? Home Team. <laughs> what is that? That's the Sean Payton. Uh, oh, the Netflix. movie? <laughs> yes. You're watching that? I, yeah. I no, put it, don't I give put them the. Don't give them the numbers. I, if I, I'm just saying. How is it so far? That's Kevin James, right? It is. It is. Um, is it as expected. <laughs> I want to say it was better than I, better than I expected, but it's exactly it's what I expected. <laughs> and if you've got, well, put it this way: I've got a lot of sanding to do right now on a on a project. A lot of sanding, sanding, sandpaper, sandblock. I know, I know yeah. what you're. So I'm I've just got a lot of surprised that you. What are you sanding? Uh, I have cut out all these like forty film reel shaped things for a decoration for a, an event. I'm, oh. I'm helping out with, and if you, now but, when you say you cut them out, I mean that I have a hole saw and I've been drilling four hundred plus holes. You into, cut them out? Yeah, I'm a man. What is, he, fellas? Yeah. I can't be the only one who's just shocked right now. Brooks, who are you, Jason? Yeah, Thank you, Brooks. He's like, wait, you did well. Keep in mind, Jeremy's been sick, so <laughs> like, I have not been able to have my man step in for me. So I've had to do this myself. It's been tough. But my whole point here is that if you have a lot of sanding work to do, okay. you too can put this on in the background what's, and sand and watch. What's it. better, the sanding or the movie? The sanding's not going well. So. <laughs> Give me Kevin James. Are you going to stain as well? Uh, no, just spray paint. We're spray painting okay. afterwards. Let's All right. right. We got to get out of here. That's going to do it. If you are thirsty for more fantasy footballers content, 
You can join our Patreon group, jointhefoot.com. There is an extra episode that will be going up either today or tomorrow. I can't keep track of what day it is, but that's going to do it for us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for today's episode. Make sure you're staying safe out there. Get ready for those rookie drafts. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.